Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, coming to you on a beautiful Cinco de Mayo here in Bethesda, Maryland. Still can't go outside, so let's do a gross path challenge. This one is a little out of order. I got confused, can't tell Saturday from Sunday from Thursday anymore, and I gave you gross path challenge number 75 yesterday without giving you number 74. So I'm gonna make that up to you. And also this one is gonna be a little special. Uh, every year as part of my uh, uh, teaching duties on gross pathology at the Joint Pathology Center, I prepare a series of tests, challenging exams for the residents. And these follow the, uh, uh, the example of the American College of Veterinary Pathologists. They are multiple choice exams. The questions are taken from recent literature as well as the reading list of the uh, American College of Veterinary Pathology. So uh, the articles are generally from uh, main uh, journals of veterinary pathology, journal of uh, veterinary diagnostic investigation, and a couple from ToxPath. Um, and then Joe Kennedy is the primary uh, uh, focus for other questions. Today's exam is gonna be 12 questions. I'm gonna split this in half, and we'll do the next one on Thursday. Uh, 12 questions today on gross pathology of horses. So I hope you enjoy it. It's going to be a little bit more challenging, I think, for many of you. But if you're up to date on the current literature, and especially if you're preparing for one of these certification exams, I think it should give you a real gross path challenge. Okay, with that, let's begin. Slide number one is tissue from a horse. Now, uh, in case you are looking at this on a small screen, I'm gonna read the uh, potential answers to you and then we will go back, give you the correct answer and tell you why some or all of the foils are incorrect. Okay, all these are gonna be tissue from a horse or maybe a, uh, a wild equid. Uh, which of the following is true? A. This lesion generally proceeds from incisor one to incisor three. B, periodontal disease is uncommon in this condition. C, resorption of the tooth begins on the external surface rather than the pulp cavity. And D, canine teeth in this horse are not affected, the lesions are restricted to the incisors. Okay, time's up. Let's take a look at the lesion. Not the best picture, but I don't know a whole lot of teeth lesions in horses. They certainly have worn teeth. They can have broken teeth. Um, they can develop caries. Um, and they, uh, older horses often develop a disease uh, which can affect all the teeth, which if you look at them, you'll see these sort of uh, brownish accumulations of cementum over the outside of some of the teeth. Here's a good one here, there's a little bit here, there is some here, you can see it out, outside here. This is a condition that is called an eorth, which is short for equine odontoclastic tooth resorption and hypercementosis. This question is taken from an outstanding article by Rebecca Smedley, uh, which was in Veterinary Pathology in 2015 and is the definitive article um, on this particular and very common condition in horses. The brownish material that you're seeing is the cementum. I'm not a huge fan of looking at horse teeth, um, but this is a condition that we see quite often. Um, if we look at this question, the correct answer was C, resorption of the tooth begins on the external surface rather than the pulp cavity. Um, this is odontoclastic resorption, and it's very much like the uh, feline equivalent, or a foal, a feline odontoclastic resorptive lesion. So I lump the two together. The difference is, that horses have this exaggerated repair response with cementum. Um, 
usually oh, the uh, resorption starts underneath the gingiva and you have a concomitant repair response with cementum. The cementum actually will sort of overgrow the lesion itself and will begin to appear on the outside of the tooth. Um, as the odontoclastic resorption heads toward the pulp cavity, the cementum will follow. And once it gets into the pulp cavity, it actually starts to coat the inside of the pulp cavity, but it hits the outside of the tooth first. Our foils were that the lesion generally proceeds from incisor one to incisor three. No, that's not correct. It generally starts from the outside and comes in and the inner incisors are the least effective. Periodontal disease is uncommon in this condition. No, you often have periodontal disease associated with it in the horses and the canine teeth are affected. As a matter of fact, the canine teeth seem to be more severely affected in this horse. So the picture is not so great. I don't have that many great pictures, but when you see the accumulation of this brown cementum on the incisors and canine teeth of the horse, this is what you want to think about. Okay. Question number two is also tissue from a horse. Viral inclusions are seen in which cell type in this condition? Your choices are A, endothelium, B, type two pneumocytes, C, bronchiolar epithelium, or D, macrophages. Okay, this is a condition that was first identified probably about 15 years ago. The, uh, the initial papers which identified the cause of this was, were published by Dr. Kurt Williams up at Michigan State University, a fantastic pulmonary pathologist. And we had seen this lesion for a while before we identified or he identified the cause for us. This is a condition which is known as equine pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and what we're looking at, and it looks like a tumor, but it's actually large areas of fibrosis, which begins in the septa. Um, it prevents any air exchange. The alveoli between all of these very restricted, they're restricted alveoli between this areas of septal and eventually diffuse fibrosis contain large numbers of macrophages. And if you want to see the inclusions that are associated with equine herpes virus type five, they will be in the macrophages. So the correct answer is D. All the other uh, answers, endothelium type one, or type two pneumocytes and bronchiolar epithelium are incorrect. And you have to scan these slides pretty good, but the, if you know the cell type to look, you're looking in the alveoli, which made it so difficult for people to figure out for so many, because everyone was checking out the, the septum, which is the area that becomes fibrotic, but it was actually in the alveoli. Um, and if you scan these, uh, eventually you will see the intranuclear herpes viral inclusion associated with equine herpes virus type five. There is a, a donkey version called uh, uh, donkey herpes virus type five, which causes a similar uh, condition in donkeys. Okay, slide number three is tissue from a horse with a catastrophic injury. Where was this injury? Okay, your choices are in the pastern joint, B in the elbow joint or the humeroradial joint, C in the humeral diaphysis, or D in the fetlock joint. Okay, if you've been keeping up with the literature, especially vet path in the last uh, number of years, you'll see an increase in uh, disease in articles that are associated with catastrophic injuries, especially in race horses. Um, Journal of Veterinary Diagnostic Investigation had a whole issue based on this. So for those of you who are 
studying for your certification exam, this is certainly something that you want to focus on these articles. There are a lot of excellent ones. And this one comes to us from an article uh, from Jennifer Janes. Uh, and it was from Je Je Journal of Veterinary Diagnostic Investigation 2017, called The Common Lesions of the Distal End of the Third Metacarpal or Metatarsal Bone in Catastrophic Breakdown Injuries in Racehorses. And one of the things that comes out of this article, and I don't dig hard for these questions, they're usually always in the abstract uh, or in the title. Um, and we're looking at the distal end of the metacarpal bone, and you can see bilaterally symmetric areas of necrosis, loss of the overlying articular cartilage. And on cross-section of one of these bones, we have a lesion that is very suggestive of an osteochondrosis lesion. This is one of the lesions that was identified on a repeat basis in this retrospective study of animals with catastrophic injuries of the fetlock joint. So the key here is fetlock joint, and the lesion that you would see is, the dis is on the distal end of the third metacarp metacarpal or metatarsal bone. Okay, slide number four is tissue from a racehorse. Well, I'll give you a little bit of uh, information here. Which of the following is the most common isolate from this particular lesion? Okay, your choices are Streptococcus equi, variant equi. B is Streptococcus equi, variant zoepidemicus. C, is E. coli or D, Staphylococcus aureus? Okay, so thinking about that, I will mention that um, I think that this particular article uh, shows something that I tell residents a lot. And that is when you culture something, you often culture the agent that is the best suited to survive in that lesion at that moment in time. It is often not a causative agent. And in certain animals like horses and cattle, you often get the same agent over and over in longstanding lesions. One of the uh, agents that you will be able to culture in most long-standing lesions in separative lesions in horses, especially pneumonias, is Streptococcus equi variant zoepidemicus. It doesn't cause a lot of disease. What it does is when the disease is well seated, it moves in and it pushes out whatever is there. It often pushes out another form, another variant of Streptococcus equi, and that's variant equi, which is well known to start and cause strangles, but over time, it gets pushed out by strep equi variant zoepidemicus. This was from a great article, 2017, by Francisco Carvalho, uh, called Study of Fatal Pneumonia in Racehorses. Right from the abstract, what's most commonly uh, cultured? Strep equi variant zoepidemicus. So if you ever see a long-standing lesion, and what we're looking at, is a fairly long-standing fibrinosuppurative pneumonia in this particular animal. This was not taken from the article, um, but it is very representative of what you'll see in these chronic pneumonias. And you can get a grab bag of various agents from these. But the main point of this particular article, or one of them was the most common isolate was Streptococcus equi variant zoepidemicus. A great example of a question from the recent literature that you might know the answer of intuitively without even having gotten to the article. But if you're preparing for an exam, I think that three years of Journal of Veterinary Diagnostic Investigation is the minimum you should be familiar with. There's great material in there. 
Okay, slide number five. Once again, tissue from a horse. Which of the following is causative for this lesion? A, dehydration. B, decreased local production of prostaglandin E2. C, direct toxicity to renal medullary epithelium. Or D, all of the above may play a role. Okay, this one is taken from Jub and Kennedy. Volume two, page 399, if you wanna read more about it. I think that this is a, uh, a good question. The lesion to many of you will be obvious. We have multifocal coalescing renal pelvic necrosis. And in horses, the thing that you wanna think about above all others is gonna be uh, overzealous administration of nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory agents. The main reason that we see this lesion, but not the only reason with nonsteroidals is B, decreased local production of prostaglandin E2. However, you can exceed the toxic level in dehydrated horses. The level goes, the toxic level is much lower in dehydrated horses. So A, whoopsie, I do this a lot. I clicked the wrong button. Uh, a, dehydration is also correct. It is causative. And C, direct toxicity to renal medullary epithelium. Yes, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are also directly toxic to renal medullary epithelium on top of shutting down the very necessary prostaglandin E2, which keeps the vasa recta open they can have direct toxicity as well. Um, certainly, uh, that's been proven many times and is one of the major reasons that they are so toxic to the kidney in rats, for example, and in cats. So they do have direct toxicity. So all of the answers are causative. D, all of the above may play a role is the correct answer. Okay, then the next slide is slide number six. And this is, once again, tissue from a horse. Which of the following is the most likely cause? A, ingestion of Fusarium verticilloides. B, Trypanosoma evansii. C, ingestion of Russian knapweed. Or D, Trypanosoma brucei. Okay, time's up. The correct answer of this particular question is B, Trypanosoma evansii. This question was taken from the Wednesday Slide Conference 2015, which is also where this image was taken from. Conference seven, case one. If you want to read more about the disease, I would also recommend Jeb and Kennedy, where it is discussed in volume three, page 124. Trypanosoma evansii is a flagellate protozoan, which in camels and horses causes a neurologic disease that mimics other types of encephalitis, uh, viral encephalitis. The animals develop profound hind limb weakness and intermittent fever. And the protozoan by unknown methods is able to cross the blood brain barrier and gain entrance into uh, the brain itself. This edema of the thalamus is very uh, characteristic of the disease, the neurologic defects probably are, are more related to the edema than anything else that it does in the brain. Um, the disease goes by the name Sura in Asia and Africa, and in Brazil, where this case was submitted to the Wednesday Slide Conference from, goes by the name Mal de Caderas. Um, the disease, as I said before, is especially bad in camelids and horses, but there are a wide range of other 
uh, animals that can be infected. If we look at our other foils, uh, D. trypanosoma brucei um, is close because trypanosoma evansi is thought to have derived by one genetic deletion from trypanosoma brucei. They're very close, but trypanosoma brucei does not cause this disease. Uh, a. Ingestion of Fusarium verticilloides. Um, that is the causative agent of fumonisin toxicity or moldy corn poisoning. It is a condition that affects the white matter of the brain in horses. It is generally associated with sphingosine uh, and sphingonine accumulation, which affects the endothelial cells, and you have uh, thrombosis, hemorrhage, and necrosis of the white matter but it very characteristically will affect the white matter of the cerebrum, and you'll have areas of malacia and necrosis. Ingestion of Russian knapweed will affect, will cause necrosis of the dopamine utilizing pathways in the brain, generally down here as well. It's a bilaterally symmetrical necrosis and hemorrhage in the substantia nigra and the globus pallidus. The location's not bad, but usually it's very well uh, located and bilateral in this area down here. Slide number seven is also tissue from a horse. Which of the following is not seen in histologic samples in this condition? A, coilocyte appearance to keratinocytes in affected tissue. B, Formation of epidermal lacunae. C, marked proliferation of dermal fibroblasts. Or D, inflammatory cells. So once again, which of the following is not seen? Three are seen in this condition, and one is not. Okay, this is one that's gonna be harder if you have not been to this article in Veterinary Pathology from 2017. There aren't a lot of conditions that are, or sorry, a lot of uh, papers written on this particular condition. We have tremendous proliferation and inflammation of the frog and probably spreads out into the, the sole of the hoof. This is a condition that's known as equine canker. It's a stinky, proliferative mess usually seen in animals that are kept in sort of moist and, and dirty conditions. Um, and the question was, which is not seen? The article was written by Dr. Aprich uh, et al. Um, so it's veterinary pathology in 2017. The article is entitled Inqu Equine Hoof Cancer, sorry, Equine Hoof Canker, Cell Proliferation and Morphology. And the correct answer is marked proliferation of dermal fibroblasts. There's not, even though it looks like there's a tremendous proliferation of fibrosis here. It's not, there is a proliferation, a tremendous proliferation of the epidermal tissue, which is hypertrophic, um, as opposed to uh, uh, the sort of warty, this is not a papillomavirus that causes coilocyte appearances. But you often will see papillomavirus infection in very proliferative lesions. You don't see that. Formation of epidermal lacunae, is seen that is very characteristic of this and a tremendous inflammatory response. So this is one you pretty much had to get to that oracle or know a whole lot about equine canker, and that's something that I don't come across very often. Slide number eight, tissue from a foal named the mutated gene. A, glial-derived neurotrophic factor. B, endothelin, B receptor, C, SLIC4A2, or D, DNA-dependent protein kinase C. Okay, time's up on this one. This is a classic uh, question. Um, it often gets on certification exams, and it shows how you need to uh, uh, no Jub and Kennedy. This one is a straight out of Jub and Kennedy. We've talked about this in previous growth path challenges. Hoping everyone got this one. The correct answer is 
B, the endothelin B receptor. Remember that normal migration of neurons to the myenteric plexus. We're looking at lethal fold syndrome. I'm sorry, I, I did not mention this animal has a very distended colon. The small colon is very hypoplastic. There's a lumen here, but it's hypoplastic because there is minimal innervation in the myenteric and aerobatic plexus here. And remember, you have to have neurons there to stimulate muscle to grow. If the neurons aren't there, um, you're going to have whether skeletal muscle, it's smooth muscle, you're just not going to have proper development. So to get back to how those neurons get there, um, it is a delivery process uh, from the neural tube, like all innervation of the body. Um, there are two different age, two different genes which mandate that. One is legal derived neurotropic factor, and the second is the endothelin B receptor. The neurotropic factor provides for proper growth when the cells are in the proper place. Endothelin B receptor inhibits that growth while they're en route, so to speak. These animals have deficient endothelin B receptors, so those neurons in the process of getting to where they're supposed to be in various aspects of the colon in these animals begin to mature ahead of time. And that's the problem with the endothelin B receptor. So you need to know this one very important question about lethal fold syndrome, uh, uh, a problem that's associated with breeding several breeds of horses together, including paints and Appaloosas. Uh, our other foils, SLC4A2, is an effective gene in osteopetrosis in foals, which is seen also in Appaloosas and Peruvian Pasifinos. And D, DNA-dependent protein kinase C, is the affected gene uh, in uh, foals with combined immunodeficiency. Slide number nine is tissue from an underweight foal. Name the most likely diagnosis. A, Salmonella typhimurium. B, Rhodococcus equi. C, Lawsonia intracellularis. Or D, Clostridium perfringens type C. Okay, time's up. Let's look at the answers on this. As we look at this, particular section. One thing that you should know, and I mentioned it was an underweight foal. Look, there's absolutely no fat here in the mesentery. This part of the gut, likely the ilium, looks very wrinkled and cerebriform from the outside. I think those two clues are excellent to get us to the correct answer, which is mentioned and discussed in Jub and Kennedy, Volume 2, pages 178 through 180, and was also featured in last week's Wednesday Slide Conference. Conference 24, case two, just last week. And the correct answer is answer C, Lawsonia intracellularis. Our foils, A, Salmonella typhimurium. Foils can certainly get it. You would probably have a reddened gut. If you opened it up, it would be, uh, you'd have thickened, a uh, diphtheritic membrane or fibrinonocrotic membrane on top. Uh, the second one is rhodococcus That's a condition that is seen in foals as well, normally animals four to eight months of age. But what you will see is on the outside, you will see tremendous uh, hypertrophy uh, and lymphadenomegaly, granulomas, lymphadenitis. If you open that up, you would see ulcers overlying the Peyer's patches and given a volcano ulcer appearance to the inside of the colon. That's a colonic disease, not an intestinal disease. And finally, Clostridium perfringens type C, also disease of foals within the first week. The beta toxin that causes the tremendous damage within the gut is trypsin label. So adult animals, or animals over the age of, of a week generally don't get that disease because the normal trypsin is, kicks in then. Animals less than seven days of age don't have a lot of trypsin because their gut is primed to absorb colostral antibodies and 
using trypsin at that time would digest them, and that's not a good thing. So Colostrum perfringens type C in foals is only very young animals within the first week of age. So the key tissue from an underweight foal, the Lawsonia foals generally are underweight. They are hyperproteinemic. You can pick them out in a field when they run with the rest of the foals uh, of that year because they're smaller, they're, they're skinny, they're runted. And the test, uh, the, the quick test for that, obviously, is to check protein levels and then you can test these animals by PCR for Lawsonia intracellular in, in feces. Where it comes from, the host that gives it to them, not exactly sure. But it can be a, a big problem in certain parts of the country where uh, horses are big business, like Kentucky. Okay, slide number 10. Name the most likely diagnosis. A, alimentary lymphoma. B, gastrointestinal stromal tumor. C, pulsion diverticulum. Or D, drachea megastoma granuloma. A lot of omas in that one. Okay, hopefully you stop the tape like you've done. Uh, took a good look at the, the possibilities and come up with the correct answer. Okay, this is discussed in Jub and Kennedy, volume two, page 111. The correct answer in this is a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. Gastrointestinal stromal tumors may be seen in multiple parts of the GI tract, but they're most commonly seen in the intestine and colon of the horse. The thing that sets this out from all the others is it is a well demarcated nodule that is on the outside of the colon. The remainder of the colon looks actually pretty good. These arise generally in the muscle layers um, and they grow outwards. Um, and this has been identified uh, in, in horses for a number of years. Our foils on this one, alimentary lymphoma. This doesn't look like lymphoma. The remaining colon looks quite good. Uh, C, pulsion diverticulum. You can see pulsion diverticulum in certain parts of the horse including the ilium, if the animal has uh, ileal hypertrophy, muscular hypertrophy, you can see them in the esophagus occasionally if there is uh, muscular hypertrophy of the esophagus. It's not a common thing. And the fact that uh, you probably wouldn't see a potion diverticulum in a colon anyhow, so it's, it is such a wide uh, area, it doesn't constrict that much and uh, probably does not have the muscle to cause a pulsion diverticulum. And finally, stoma granuloma, that's in the stomach. And you would see that at the uh, interface of the glandular and squamous stomach, also known as the margus, margo plicatus. Um, and you would see them, they generally project from the margo plicatus. They have a hole where the female worm will uh, occasionally uh, extend the hind end and lay eggs to continue the life cycle. Okay, slide number 11. We only have two left. Also tissue from a horse. Which of the following is correct concerning this condition? A, inflammatory changes affect peripheral nerves, but not the spinal cord itself. B, equine herpes virus type 1 has been identified as the cause of this lesion. C, sensory and autonomic ganglia are unaffected. Or D, granulocytes compose a significant part of the inflammatory process. So which of the following is true of those four choices? Okay, so a great example of a question. Um, which is very common these days in certification exams where you're expected to be able to identify this lesion. It's a very characteristic lesion. We are looking at the cauda equina or the tail end of the spinal cord. You can see these very large spinal roots which emerge from here and innervate things like the bladder and the anus and the tail. Uh, and the hind limbs are probably, those, those nerves are, are much higher on here. But it's the end of the horse past the hind limbs. Um, so this is a question that's straight out of Jevon Kennedy. 
uh, volume one and and so this is a classic lesion what we can see is uh, that the spinal nerves are sort of glued in place by a combination of fibrous connective tissue hemorrhage and as we said so many times before when you see hemorrhage you want to think about necrosis so an inflammatory lesion in a caudal equina um, there are very few of these in the horses and the classic one is cauda is neuritis of the cauda equina this is a condition that does not have a definite cause it uh, um, has had a number of causes thrown at it, but none of them have been uh, uh, shown to be the cause of this condition. At this point, it's thought to be autoimmune based. Uh, and if we look at our questions, um, the correct answer, hopefully you got this, is A, inflammatory changes affect peripheral nerves, but not the spinal cord itself. Um, yes, these affect, primarily affects the cauda equina, which is not the spinal cord proper. Um, and you can also see it in uh, some of the cranial nerves as well, but you will not see inflammation in the spinal cord proper. Uh, our foils, equine herpes virus type 1 has been identified as a cause of the lesion. It has been identified in one case, um, but is not considered the cause of this lesion. Uh, sensory and autonomic ganglia are unaffected. That is correct. Um, it does not affect the ganglia. And granulocytes compose a significant part of the inflammatory process. No, they do not. Granulocytes being neutrophils primarily, eosinophils are not part of the inflammatory process. This is primarily a form of granulomatous inflammation. Uh, you will see a tremendous number of, of macrophages, especially uh, those with foamy cytoplasm as they destroy the myelin in these nerves. And you'll also see lymphocytes and plasma cells as part of that granulomatous inflammation, but neutrophils are not a significant component. A word to the wise, this, this particular condition often makes its way out the certification exams as well. I strongly recommend everybody look into describing one of these slides, either on VISPO, or if you receive the Wednesday slide conference, there are a couple of cases over the last decade of this in there. It is a uh, somewhat difficult description and one that you should have done before you take it, take your certification examination. Okay, our last slide for today is once again, a tissue from a horse with a catastrophic injury. Remember, go back, hit those articles on uh, racehorse and racetrack injuries. Um, so, tissue from a horse from a catastrophic injury. What is the most likely diagnosis? A, osteosarcoma. B, stress fracture with callus. C, bone fragility syndrome, or D, steroid-induced osteopenia. Okay, time's up on this one. This is a image that is very similar to one that came out of an article by Sue Stover and others from University of California, Davis which appeared in, the, in that full journal issue of Journal of Veterinary Diagnostic Investigation 2017, which addressed racehorse injuries. And Dr. Stover is an expert on racehorse injuries. Uh, she also will be uh, doing a lecture on racehorse injury on our, in our day seminar on the 12th of May. Not why I put this slide in here. The image is very close to what was in that article, but I, this was provided to me by Dr. Paku Zal, who is a co-author. And uh, thank you to him for providing this great and illustrative uh, illust picture of this catastrophic injury. And here's the injury right here. This 
a bone just broke in half of the diaphysis right through the lesion here. Looks like humorous to me. So the correct response is B, stress fracture with callus. A lot of these animals already have pre-existing stress fractures. This is the callus that was formed. And then we have a catastrophic injury which broke here. Looks like there's another fracture, slab fracture here. So this bone was probably put back together to take or glued together to take this picture. Uh, your other choices were osteosarcoma. Uh, not familiar with many osteosarcomas. They're certainly not focal uh, in the horse and so well demarcated. Uh, bone fragility syndrome is a very interesting uh, condition that is caused by silicates in horses. There was a wonderful uh, couple of submissions over the last five years. The Wednesday slide conference was dealt with uh, silicosis, pulmonary silicosis in horses, as well as bone fragility syndrome. I think there's a lot to be worked out on that condition, but you get uh, a thinning of bones, particularly the scapula uh, in these horses. Um, and finally, steroid-induced osteopenia. I would like to say that nobody ever gives racehorses steroids. It's probably not the truth. Um, steroids normally will cause osteopenia by increasing osteoplastic resorption of bone, decreasing osteoblastic production of bone, and is one of the three main causes of osteopenia um, in many species, but not common in horses that I know of. So the correct answer, straight out of this great article, stress fracture with callus. And this is almost identical to a, uh, one of the images in that article. Okay, well that brings us to the end of this particular uh, ghost path challenge. I'm sure you found it challenging. If I hadn't written these questions, I would find it very challenging myself. But the great part about working at the JPC is I have a great group of residents who are extremely intelligent. They keep me on my toes, so I have to keep up with the literature as well. Uh, we will, tomorrow we have the publishing of the results on Wednesday slide conference, the last one for the year uh, 2000, well, the year 2019, 2020. Woohoo, I get the summer off. And then uh, I'll be back on Thursday with the other half of this particular examination. So it gives you time to, uh, uh, between now and then, cover the literature and scour the literature for some of these great articles. So thanks for spending time with me today, and we'll see you again on Thursday, May 7th. Happy Cinco de Mayo, everyone.